Hi guys, we're gonna take this pretty unassuming looking JK on a road trip. It looks like a regular old JK, but it's not. It has an LT4. I think one of the clues would be these axles. We've got a Dana 80 in the rear, 60 in the front. I didn't realize this was a uh, commemorative edition. But yeah, we're gonna take it on a long road trip and see how it does. The customer was gracious enough to allow me to do that. Let's do a cold start with this LT4. A lot of guys think that because an engine has a lot of power, it has to be radical, but it's really not. Let's fire this thing up. Back in the day, and I talk a lot about back in the day because that's where I come from, we had some radical engines with carburetors. I remember the early DZ motors and some of the Shelbys. They, you had to fire those things up. GM gave you a choke. Sometimes they were electronic, sometimes they were manual but some of the engines like the original zl1 and i'm not talking about the new zl1s where you just put a key in and turn it and you got fuel injection i'm talking about the original zl1s where gm just said screw it and didn't even put a choke on i'd get out and i'd pour some gas down the carburetor to get those things fired up it was usually the easiest way and it was a track motor so to get that kind of horsepower back then and these motors were pushing 450 to 500 horsepower that's what you had to do Today it's a different world. As you can see, this LT4 is docile as a Hyundai Sonata. It has literally no rump rump rub. The cam is perfectly smooth. You can barely hear the engine run. It sounds more like an electric motor than it does a combustion engine. It will idle at 400 RPM, 500 RPM. It's just a whole different world. So a lot of guys think that it's odd, kind of like that guy with the Parrot, but you can have an engine with 700 horsepower and make it a grocery getter, drive it every day, get reasonable economy. We're back on the road with the LT4. There's not a whole lot to say. It's like being in your living room, driving this down the highway. I don't think this Jeep has downshifted at a tenth since we got on the highway. We have a fully loaded Rubicon up there that it seems like this happens every trip. On the downhills, he blows by, the, by us, but on the uphills, um, we go by him. So probably down the road here, we're gonna end up passing him. I wanted to talk about vehicle speed a second because it's a question I get a lot. How do I calibrate my vehicle speed after the conversion, before the conversion, what do I do? And it's a little bit complex. And I do apologize, um, the speedometer on this vehicle is off quite a bit. Uh, we didn't reset the tire size after we changed the tires out. We went to 37 inch KO2 all terrains, awesome tire. I, I, in fact, I don't even think I can hear these tires. Can't hear the engine. I can hear the wind noise and probably more than anything else the Atlas, but that's still so quiet that there's just not a whole lot there. So as far as the vehicle speed goes, in the JK, the vehicle speed is sensed by the ABS module. There's four wheel speed sensors that are sent to the ABS module, they're averaged, then sent over the network. So the PCM and the TIPM, or the ECM in this case, get this information and then use it. If you start messing with that, like we have a Jeep in the shop where the PCM was removed, not our single module system, but a competitor Jeep, and the odometer and tripometer are all, all over the place. So the vehicle speed signal is transmitted onto the CAN network from the ABS module. That means that when you calibrate, well, let me back up. If you've got a stock tire, let's say you got up to a 32 inch Rubicon or Sahara, you can calibrate that right through YTEC, through the factory Chrysler software, and it's going to work. But if you've got oversized tires, 35, 37, 40, normally you have to calibrate it outside of the calibration or outside of the PCM. And that's what things like the AEV Procal and Superchips do. To answer the question about how to calibrate your speedometer, you just do it like you always did. Remember, we're leaving the Jeep side pier, so you can hook up a Procal, you can hook up a Superchips, you can hook up a Bully Dog, whatever you want, and calibrate your speedometer. It's not going to affect the GM side, it's not going to affect the drivability, it's just going to calibrate your speedometer and your ESP. Now remember that ESP, things like ABS, is slaved to vehicle speed and proper wheel speed detection, all four wheels. So if you start messing with that, putting different axles in, then that's one of the reasons Chrysler offers the, the ESP bypass, the steering wheel dance, 
because in off-road vehicles or modified vehicles, um, ESP can actually do some bad things. If our big buddy up there is with us in the 80 mile an hour zone, I'm gonna say that his days of glory are over. I can see him fading back on these slight grades. This LT4 is not even downshifting into ninth. It's just holding tenth up these hills. So he had a good half mile lead on us when we started going up this hill and you can see that's fading rapidly. In fact, I don't want to uh, get out of cruise control, so we're just gonna hold it right here. Come on, buddy. All right, we just downshifted in a ninth. That's the first time. So I'm sure he's saying, well, what's going on? Why did you pass me so easy? And guys, let me tell you something. I've been doing a lot of highway driving here and uh, watch out for these minivans. These little vans can go 100 miles an hour without breaking a sweat. I know, because I have one. They're so aerodynamic, they're so low to the ground, they're running such small tires, such low friction, that they just sail along on the highway. So as you can see this, uh, well, it looks like we were in eighth gear. Um, this LT4 doesn't miss a beat on the highway. It just makes it completely effortless. Well, here comes Big Buddy. We're on the flat. Come on, guy. By the way, we are running triple digits today. It's earlier in the morning and we're probably gonna be seeing higher temps later on. Here we are going through the uh, Virgin Gorge. I wanted to mention about economy. Maybe a few weeks ago, you guys remember a video I did on a LT 5.3 10 speed, black and green. That customer picked it up from the shop drove it 1,200 miles and ended up back in Washington and said that he averaged on the highway now 20.1 miles to the gallon and I think that's phenomenal. A lot of guys say or think they're getting over 20 miles to the gallon. I will say in my stock 3.8 Jeep with the 32 inch tires going down a hill, I could get that thing to get over 20 miles to the gallon but then when we got up into the mountains, it would drop back down into the teens. So 20.1 miles to the gallon is nothing to sneeze at and he told me that he was sailing up the hills and the grades and he wasn't slowing down. Now, I don't expect to get anywhere near that kind of mileage in this Jeep. This Jeep has got a much larger engine, a 6.2. It is supercharged. Believe it or not, it's lower compression. The 5.3 is about 11 to one, the LT, where this is 10 to one, because obviously it's got a blower on it. So in the normally aspirated mode, we may not see the same economy as let's say an LT1 with 11 and a half to one compression. And when we do go into boost, going up some of these grades, which I don't think I really have so far, but on some of the lo longer grades, we might stay in a high gear and go into a slight amount of boost. I find that that can help your economy a little. But at the end of the day, if you have a 650 horsepower Jeep that has the drivability of a Toyota Corolla and gets anywhere near reasonable economy, that is quite an achievement. All of us have seen the prototype JL392 Hemi and I think they're touting something like zero to 60 in five seconds or less. And a big part of that is the transmission. The 6.4 Hemis have a lot of power, but in the early days, especially with the older 545 RFE, they were really burdened. Then they went to the WA580, which is a much better transmission, and now they went to the eight speed, which is a pretty good transmission. So a lot of the performance and economy that we're seeing these days isn't so much from the, tr the engine technology. Now I will argue with the LTs adding direct injection and high compression, that um, that definitely helped. But with the Hemi, it's pretty much had the same technology for a while. I know you guys like to look at data, so let's look at some data. We're just south of Cedar City. This LT has really been running fabulous on the highway. I think it only downshifted out of tenth once or twice. So this is our temperature screen. We have intake temp at 104, that's not bad considering our ambient temp is about 100. Trans temp's 215, engine's 217, and considering that, again, the ambient's over 100 degrees and we're cruising about 80 miles an hour, um, 
that's very acceptable. Oil temp's 240, again, that's a calculated value, so take it with a grain of salt, but it's definitely within range. I have not been noticing a lot of retard in this engine, which tells me I could probably kick it up a little bit, but this is the factory setting, so I'm gonna kinda leave it here. I think it's got plenty of horsepower. Control module voltage is about 13 and a half to 14, right where we wanna be. AC pressure is relatively low. With the air conditioning system, once you get going down the road and the cab starts cooling off, it kind of reduces the load and you're gonna see those pressures come down. If we were sitting in traffic with zero speed and the fan was screaming, trying to keep those pressures down, it's kind of a different environment. But catalytic converter temperature is 1500 degrees. You guys might or might not know what the cats do, but essentially they kind of reverse the process of combustion. There's things called hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and CO. Hydrocarbon is basically a, f a raw fuel atom, gasoline, butane, propane. Carbon monoxide is a partially burned fuel atom. So think of a marshmallow that's white on the inside and burnt on the outside. It's still volatile, meaning it's not inert. Volatile means it still can combust when combined with oxygen. And those get out into the exhaust system because no engine is 100% efficient and then they have to be dealt with and there's another gas called NOx or nitrates of oxygen that's where nitrogen and oxygen atoms melt together you're breathing about 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen there's some trace gases and if you look at that haze out there I'm told that's from the California fires but getting back to the converters Basically, the converters try to clean up those bad gases, COHC and NOx. And X can refer to the number of atoms, oxygen atoms on the nitrogen atom, and there's different kinds. There's photochemical NOx, which combines with sunlight and makes that brown haze. But this haze is not from NOx. This haze is from a fire in California. So what the converter does with these high temps is it combines elements with oxygen, essentially. So it can take CO and turn it into CO2. It can also break up hydrocarbons and CO and turn them into H2O. That's obviously water, and that's sometimes why you see water coming out the tailpipe. So what is, I used to instruct in, uh, in emissions, and the answer to what does a catalytic converter do? It takes bad gases and converts them into harmless gases. How does it do it? Well, that, that's another discussion. However, just know that, uh, that you want to keep that converter pretty hot, especially for NOx, because it takes a lot of temperature, about 2,500 degrees, to melt nitrogen and oxygen atoms together. So equally, it takes high temperature to break them apart. Let's look at another page of information. We're just kind of cresting this hill, so the O2s are a little bit scratchy but we're still staying in 10th gear and we're still staying in closed loop. You can tell we're in closed loop because the air-fuel ratio is still 14.7 to 1. If we look on the fuel trims, we've been running negative 7, 10 to positive 5 throughout the trip, so that's pretty good. Being that it's 100 to something degrees out, I do notice the trims stay a little bit uh, negative. I think it's because of the volatility of the fuel. Um, vacuum. Now that's an interesting uh, parameter in this vehicle because you can see we got negative vacuum right now, but when it goes into boost, that's gonna approach zero and then go into positive pressure. That's what gives you the power with a supercharger. Our fuel rail pressure is running 1,400 PSI. So that's 1,400 PSI. I've seen it up to 16, 1,700. I think the computer just bases it off of the need of the engine. That's because we have direct injectors. Now remember that these injectors are putting the fuel right into the combustion chambers that are exposed to combustion. And that technology took a long time to rationalize, but here it is. And we need that high pressure to efficiently deliver the fuel into the chamber. It's not like putting fuel into a carburetor bowl and have the Venturi effect suck it out through an intake or squirting fuel behind the intake valve with some kind of fuel injection. This is actually pushing the fuel directly into the uh, into the combustion chamber. And finally, we got our EVAP, which you're gonna see that go up and down and all over the place. The GM system does use a closed loop feedback EVAP system, 
So it monitors the fuel tank pressure and then it purges and, and vents accordingly. It does have a separate vent uh, valve or vent solenoid to vent the system if it goes over pressure. Uh, why do we have to purge? Well, uh, inside the fuel system, especially the fuel tank, vapors are built up and those vapors are hydrocarbons and we don't want them getting into the atmosphere. So the charcoal canister stores those vapors and it uses charcoal, or you guys call it an evap canister, and it uses this canister with charcoal to store the vapors. And then when the purge valve opens to intake manifold vacuum, it sucks those vapors in and then of course burns them in combustion. And that's one of the reasons, and by the way, we just had to let off the gas because we're in traffic and notice that our O2's flat line. Now I'm back on the throttle so they came back up. We need the EVAP system to keep those hydrocarbons out of the atmosphere. Some Jeeps that weren't properly set up that didn't have proper valving would go off road, they'd be going over whoop de doos bouncing up and down and fuel would slosh into that into that EVAP hose between the tank and the canister and fill the canister up with gasoline. So a lot of guys would just ditch the EVAP canister and in a race application I guess that's okay but I personally hate that smell of fuel, especially in my garage. Let's look at this page. On the left side is our monitor status. Most of you know that MoTeC does not just randomly turn off the codes and disable the monitors. We have executive order bills, we have to meet US EPA and CARB standards. So the monitors are all active. All the Mode 6 data is active. We have three monitors here on incomplete because back in Cedar City, I did a little bit of tuning and I cleared the monitors. There were six of them inc incomplete at that point, now there's three, so three have set. Now we're not going to set the EVAP and the O2 today because those do require a couple of drive cycles and heat, hot, cold cycles. So it's got to, the engine temp's got to drop below about 90 degrees for those to set. So those might, may not set today, tomorrow, maybe the next day, we'll see. Fuel system should set tomorrow. This is a direct injected engine, so it's got a little bit more stuff going on. Now look at the right side. This is transmission data. You can see gear up there on the top right. How many of you have seen that you're in 10th gear displayed on your Prindle? Probably not many guys in JKs. But we are in 10th gear and we've pretty much been staying in 10th gear for uh, this entire trip. It downshifted a couple of times, but really maybe once or twice. We are bombing along here at 80 miles an hour and this LT is just humming. LT4 should I say. So look at the bottom right, transmission input speed sensor, and then the bottom left, transmission output speed sensor. Now transmission input speed sensor you would think would be the same as engine RPM, which you see there in the middle, but it's not. And the reason is we have a fluid coupling. So if you look at the top left, you notice it says torque converter clutch slippage? Well, this computer can control how much that converter clutch slips. That way when you come to a stop, you can idle and the engine's not gonna stall. Or if I need a little bit of power, like I'll give it a little bit of throttle right now, you notice that the slippage went up. Well, it's using the torque multiplication in that converter to get more power to the wheels. So it didn't shift, it stayed in 10th gear. It slipped, almost like slipping the clutch for you manual transmission guys. It slipped the converter. This is a pulse width modulated converter, meaning it's not like the old 700R4 or 4L60 where it was on or off. And that's why you see that number moving. You also see that number going to the negative. Why is that? Well, when you overrun the converter, like you're decelerating, the transmission is going to be going faster than the engine. So you're going to see that number going to the negative. But the computer knows all this and it takes it into account. Now, if you look at the transmission output shaft, it's running over a thousand RPM faster than engine RPM or transmission input. Why is that? Well, because this is an overdrive transmission. This isn't a three speed that's one to one on top. It's not a four speed. It's not a five speed. It's not an eight speed. It's a 10 speed. So it's got a really, really tall top gear. And that's one of the reasons we can cruise down the highway so comfortably. So that overdrive is now allowing the engine RPM to stay low. Now we are at about 2300 RPM at 80 miles an hour, which one could argue is a little bit high for this combination. So if this, this vehicle has, let's say, 
456s, we can go to, to 410s, and I bet you our mileage would pick up, and it would be a little bit nicer to drive, but, but really, this is a performance vehicle. It runs so good. It's got such good throttle response. This 10-speed does such a phenomenal job. Uh, I was driving one the other day, like I mentioned in another video, that came in from a competitor, and we were turning over 3,000 RPM at 80. In fact, we were turning about 3,000 RPM at 70, and I, there's just no way I could drive that long distances without going nuts. So this overdrive is allowing us to run a low engine RPM and run high speeds on the highway. But at the same time, the 10L80 has a very low first gear. It's about 4.7 to one. And then you combine that with the torque converter clutch slippage, and it means you can really launch hard even a heavy JK, and then when you get on the uh, highway, drop them RPM, drop the RPM way down. Recently, I did a video on a guy that wants to run fast zero to 60 times, but he wants to do it with a manual transmission. If you look at most of the modern vehicles that are really performance, that are running the three second, four second, zero to 60, these guys are running automatic transmissions, and they are taking full advantage of power braking, meaning loading the drivetrain, and then launching, like launch assist and then lightning fast shifts, shifts that happen in milliseconds, faster than anybody could ever shift a manual transmission, push in a clutch, etc. And the results are, yes, you can easily achieve those results. It's a little more difficult with a manual, you really know how, you have to know how to drive, but this 10 speed makes it easy. Basically, you just have a, uh, a throttle pedal. And then, as you can see here, the computer does a rest. Now, you notice with the torque converter clutch slippage, it's staying pretty close to zero, going down the road. So we're not building up heat in the transmission. We are almost the same as a manual transmission with the clutch released and locked up. In the old days, we really couldn't do that. Before we had the lockup converters, there was always that slippage. That slippage was always creating drag, creating heat. It was something we had to fight. But as you can see in this modern transmission, we're almost as good as a manual transmission when it comes to the lockup on the highway. Here we are in Salt Lake. When I got here, it was 101 degrees and raining. Go figure. So we're bombing along here about 80 miles an hour. Weather in Utah is always strange. It was about 100 degrees and we got these giant raindrops coming down. We're seeing a little hood flutter on this one, which is interesting. They had the hood uh, straps fixed back in like 09, 010. I went with the Deco uh, plastic uh, polyurethane ones and they work awesome. We are back in Beaver getting some gas and this LT4JK is clean. We just went through a rainstorm even though it's close to 100 degrees out. I don't think we ever took a good look at this JK. Customer did a great job keeping it simple and clean. I like his bumpers. I think these are the Jeep bumpers that they offer for this model. These Sahara style rock rails which are simple and work well. As far as the tire carrier goes, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So we originally mounted it on the tailgate, but it was just too heavy. I hate it when the tailgate's all floppy and banging around. So we got some hinge mounted brackets that are gonna support the 37 inch tire just fine. Most of the JKs I drive are on 40s and really pimped out. This JK, while it's got some mods to it, it's been done very tastefully. And it's very quiet and smooth. And I've got to say, for one of the first times when I was up in Salt Lake, I was driving my wife's 17 Pacifica. And that vehicle is, uh, you know, we got some pretty strong rain here. Um, that vehicle is really quiet and smooth. And normally when I get out of a Jeep and I get into that, there's this feeling of, wow, what a difference. But when I got out of this and got into that, I gotta say, I think I think in a lot of ways this Jeep actually drives nicer, smoother, quieter. I think it has a lot to do with the tires. These tires are very compliant, they're the all-terrain twos. They're not only very quiet, but they go over bumps in the road like nothing. Where in Salt Lake, if you guys have never been there, the roads are very, uh, very rough. Um, the rain gutters are very steep. The driveways are very steep. So you're always slamming down on uh, lower vehicles. But this Jeep just 
cruise along. So I thought that that was an interesting thing. Now, as far as this drive goes, we've had heat, we've had rain, we've had wind. Pretty typical for a, a drive to Salt Lake. This LT4, like I said, just absolutely doesn't care about the terrain. Doesn't care about going up a hill, doesn't care about going down a hill. Everything hit seems like it's a flat ground. The mileage wasn't quite as good as I expected. This Jeep is geared for performance. So it's not bad. I mean, we're cruising just 22, 2300 RPM at 80. I'm sure we could pick up a little mileage if we re-geared, but that's really not what this thing is about. We got on the low side, the high 13s, and on the high side, the low 15s. So that's not fabulous, but for a over 600 horsepower Jeep with the driving manners of this one, I think that's very acceptable. I have a lot of guys on 37s getting significantly less than that with a lot less horsepower. Here we are in Las Vegas, just before sunset. This LT4 really made this drive easy. Pretty much cruised at 80 miles an hour most of the way. 